Good evening and welcome to Rock Center. The impact of Apple on life in America is well established. By any standard, they have changed our electronics and our culture. And whether you're the owner of Apple products or not, you've got to admit that much. As much as any company can be about one guy, Apple was Steve Jobs. And now that Steve Jobs is gone, Apple is run by Tim Cook. He hasn't talked a whole lot about his life or his business. He certainly hasn't done so on television until now. Apple is famously secretive, and so it, while it took months of meetings and negotiations, Tim Cook agreed to be interviewed, and we met up at one of the places Apple has transformed. Nobody remembers the guy who came after Thomas Edison. And nobody seems to recognize Tim Cook as we walk together across the teeming floor of Grand Central Station. I'm a private person and, you know, I like my being anonymous. As we walk, we're surrounded by examples of what Apple has done to our society, both good and bad. People now live their lives while listening to the soundtrack of their lives, communicating with members of their own community while ignoring the actual community around them. And in this marble monument to another time where trains lumber to a halt two stories beneath our feet, we go up the stairs into what we were told the future would look like. The red shirts greet us, and Tim Cook is home now in the Apple store, where the successor to Jobs is suddenly treated more like Jagger. Hey, good to see you. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. I've been with you for a long time. Thank you. Thank you for me, please. Oh. I'm a big fan. I have been a big fan for for, for years. There you yeah. go. It's pretty spectacular. Who else would have put a store like this in Grand Central? And who else would have us believe they intend to be the one company that reverses hundreds of years of business history by becoming the one company that never fades away into irrelevance? You realize if you're a company that can keep amazing us, consumers, if you're a company that can stay fresh without an expiration date, you'll be the first company ever to do that. There is a cycle, a circle of life, um, a life and death, and you're trying to buck that trend. Don't bet against this rock. Don't bet against this. We started our day with Tim Cook in lower Manhattan at another of his 250 austere Apple stores, where we began the questioning with what's different about it. How are you not Steve Jobs? In many ways, one of the things he did for me uh, that removed a gigantic burden that would have normally existed is he told me on a couple of occasions uh, before he passed away to never question what he would have done. Never ask the question what Steve would have done to just do what's right. Doing right has done well for Tim Cook so far. He's had a good first year on the job. The company's stock is up about 45% during his tenure. And think about this. He's already presided over the rollout of three iPads, two iPhones, and three Macs. It has been absolutely stunning. Every detail has been focused on. So you've got guys whose job it is to get this mesh right, to get this... This to curve get, right. To get it precisely right. In fairness, however, this past year they haven't gotten everything precisely right. Weather? Nice weather. Starting with Siri, the small woman who lives in your iPhone. The service amazed all of us at first, but then came under criticism for not being perfect or as consistently amazing as Steve Jobs wanted it to be. Then there are the maps. iPhones used to come with Google Maps until they set out on their own. But Apple's version wasn't quite ready for launch. It lacked some critical street smarts. And in those early days, God help you if you went anywhere near the Brooklyn Bridge or the Hoover Dam. It was a rare and public embarrassment, and Cook fired two top executives in charge. How big of a setback was Maps? It didn't meet our customers' expectations, and our expectations of ourselves are even higher than our customers. Uh, however, I can tell you, so we screwed up. And you said goodbye to some executives. Well, we screwed up, and we are putting the weight of the company behind correcting it. As for the iPhone 5 itself, they have flown off those perfect Apple Store shelves. All right, there you go. 
Apple sold 5 million of them in the first weekend alone, breaking all previous sales records. But buyers of the iPhone 5 soon discovered they had to buy something else. None of the old power cords work on the new equipment. Why did we have to buy new cords for this? As it turns out, we had a connector, 30-pin connector, yeah. that we used for a decade or more. 500 of them. You have a few of those yeah. on, on iPod. But Brian, it was one of those things where we couldn't make this product with that connector. But let me tell you, the product is so worth it. And that's the thing about Apple. Sleek isn't cheap. Those white earbuds announced to the world you've got a couple of hundred dollars to spend. Your investment will buy you a staggeringly beautiful product that works unlike any other. And in a lot of workplaces, including our own, the Apple products you'll see are the ones people bring in from home. They're usually right there on the desk next to the computers we have to use for work. Apple prides itself on being equal parts computer company and religion. Apple fans get whipped up into a stampeding froth with every new product release. Customers famously camp outdoors and then emerge triumphant, emotionally spent. Journalists flock to those dramatic product rollouts as if the CEO is going to reveal stone tablets instead of the kind with scratch-proof glass. And the legendary Apple culture of secrecy is designed to keep it that way. Why are you institutionally so secretive? Why, how is it that you know how many times I've listened to a Bob Dylan song or a Kendrick Lamar song or Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas and yet we never get to know anything about you guys? We think that holding our product plan secret is very important because people love surprises. This was one surprise Apple could not have loved, the new Samsung ad campaign. It's blistering, bold, damaging. It portrays Apple products and people who love them as somehow passe and uncool, even desperate. It's a blunt instrument disguised as satire, and it's a frontal attack on a giant that would have been unthinkable not too long ago. Hey, what'd you just do? Uh, I just sent him a playlist. By touching thumbs? Yeah. What symbol is it? It's the Galaxy S3. I'll see you at the studio later. When do you think we're going to be able to... Do that thing. Hey. Hey. hey, Mom, Dad. Oh, thanks for holding our spot. You guys have fun. Well, my midnight, you too. <laughs> the next big thing is already here. The Samsung Galaxy S3. Wait, honey, this is the line for apps. The unmistakable message right there, Apple products are for your parents. Samsung makes the really cool stuff, and they're much more casual about it. They came along and tried to paint those with white earbuds, Apple users, as losers. They're trying to paint their product as cool and yours as not cool. Is this thermonuclear war. Well, we love our customers and uh, we're, we'll fight to defend them with anyone. Uh, is it thermonuclear war? Um, the, the, the reality is, is that we love competition at Apple. We think it makes us all better. But we want people to invent their own stuff. He's talking about the legal fight between Apple and Samsung. They've sued each other in courts around the world over patent infringements. Apple won the last round in the U.S. when a jury ruled Samsung owed them a billion dollars for stealing ideas. Samsung was back in court just today appealing the judgment. Sometimes the business of making pretty things is ugly. How tough is your business? How surprised would we civilians be? and how rough it gets, spying, skullduggery, it's tough. It's very tough. Uh, you have people trying to hack into systems on a constant basis. Uh, you have people trying to elicit confidential information uh, about future product plans. All of these things are things that we constantly fight. And then there's Tim Cook's larger challenge, the man who rhapsodizes about the perfectly rounded edges of his products, vows to always keep Apple cutting edge. It sounded to me like you and I grew up the same American life, kind of a grindingly simple and normal American middle class household. When you and I as kids would go to a neighbor's house and see under their new TV Sony Trinitron, 
that would tell us something instantly, and you're smiling. And that brand lasted up until um, uh, Walkman, Discman. But then, fast forward to today, it's less meaningful. How do you not become Sony, with all apologies to Sony? We're very simple people at Apple. We focus on making the world's best product and enriching people's lives. I think some companies, uh, maybe even the one that you mentioned, maybe they decided that they could do everything. We have to make sure at Apple that we stay true to focus, laser focus. We can only do great things a few times, only on a few products. But will the next great thing be Apple's long rumored move into the television business? It's a market that we have intense interest in, and it's a market that we see that has been left behind. What does he mean by that? Tim Cook goes on to talk about that. We'll show you as much as he's willing to say about what might be the next big thing when we come back with part two of our interview right after this break.